All right, so following the brief introductory video, we'll have uh, two parts of the talk. This is the first part, um, which will be on equivariant instanton bundles. Um, so we're talking about what are called mathematical instanton bundles, and we'll talk about the distinction between just instanton bundles and mathematical instanton bundles. These are holomorphic rank two vector bundles over CP3. Um, and they arise as the cohomology of a monad. So a monad is a complex of vector bundles looking like this, um, where each of these maps, the, um, well, it's a complex. So the uh, kernel of one map contains the um, image of the previous map. And the only cohomology is in this middle term. So right here, and the vector bundle is the uh, cohomology at this stage of the monad. And so W and V are vector spaces. V has a complex symplectic structure, um, and these two maps are symplectic adjoints of each other. It's so often said to be self-dual. So um, these um, instanton bundles um, and the monads first arose in the work of Atia Drinfeld, Hitchin, and Mani in the famous work of 1978, um, where they classified instantons. And instantons are self-dual or anti-self-dual Yang-Mills connections over the four-dimensional sphere. And they're related to these instanton bundles via um, the Penrose transform. And so the original use of the um, monads and the instanton bundles arose in classifying the instantons, the anti-self-dual connections over the force sphere. Um, that actually involved a reality condition. The um, holomorphic bundles over CP3 coming from monads correspond to Yang-Mills instantons on S4, if and only if um, the there's an additional real structure, which involves both real and quaternionic structures in some of these vector spaces. And if you don't have that, if you drop that condition, the holomorphic bundles are just called instanton bundles or mathematical instanton bundles. Um, so the other thing that happened in the original work of um, the Tiedrin Falhajimanin, which is important for us, is that these vector spaces here can be identified as various sheaf cohomology groups of um, bundles constructed from the bundle um, that this is realizing, All right? So um, what we're gonna consider is an SL2C action on CP3. So SL2C is a complex three-dimensional group. CP3 is a complex three-dimensional manifold. Um, and the, the particular one that we're gonna um, study is if we have the irreducible representation of SL2 on C4, which we'll call V3 is, what we call this representation. Um, the VD is the irreducible representation of dimension D plus one. And remember for SL2, there's an irreducible representation for each dimension. Um, here's the characters of that. Um, and so if you look at that, the um, this particular action on CP3, if you projectivize that, has an open dense orbit. And then the complement of that is a hypersurface, which of course is invariant. It's a degree four hypersurface. And that hypersurface consists of a two-dimensional orbit, and its closure is a one-dimensional orbit of SL2, and that's actually the twisted cubic. Um, so you have three orbits on SL2, the open three-dimensional orbit, its complement is a union of two orbits, one is two-dimensional and one is one-dimensional. And so what we're gonna do to understand um, the equivariant instantons it restrict this SL2 action to a, a C star subgroup, a one dimensional subgroup. Um, and if you look at that, any C star subgroup um, has four fixed points and two of those are on the two dimensional SL2 orbit and two of those are on the one dimensional SL2 orbit. Um, so uh, if you're looking at instant, I'm sorry, if you're looking at instanton um, bundles, which lift that SL2 action to a bundle, what you need to look at is you need to find the possible representations of those vector spaces in the monad. And the way you can do that is by um, looking at how the C star action lifts each fiber since it's a fixed point. It's an automorphism of each fiber. So there's uh, four fixed points, there's four fibers over that, which are actually with an automorphism. Um, and if the if you look at two points that are in the same SL2 orbit, remember there's two pairs of fixed points, um, two in each orbit, um, then they, if they're isomorphic to C star reps, 
And you can figure out that the character has to look like this for some integer k greater than or equal to zero. And the fact that this is odd is because there is a invariant symplectic structure. Um, and so what you can say, okay, so if I look at the various values of this integer, there's a value that'll happen on one of the um, pairs of orbits. There's a different value that'll happen on the other pairs of orbits. So basically, uh, the there's an invariant of a SL2 equivariant bundle, which consists of two of these integers. One is the um, basically the weight of the um, of the action on the fixed points, the C star action on C star fixed points on one of the orbits, and the M prime is the one on the other orbit. Okay. So there's this pair of integers. Um, and it's not clear whether there are equivariant bundles for any possible um, combination of these integers. But if you have a equivariant bundle, there's a well-defined invariant consisting of a pair of odd integers. Okay. And so uh, when I started this work, it was way back in the 90s, I was working with Gil Bohr, and we were looking at equivariant um, instanton bundles that were actually the uh, physics instanton bundles. So they satisfied the additional real condition because we were actually interested in Yang-Mills connections on S4 that had a, the corresponding symmetry and that's the real form of the symmetry now SU2. Um, and by this ADH correspondence, those corresponded to SU2 invariant angles and S4 corresponded to SU2 equivariant bundles on CP3, which of course complexified to SL2 invariant or equivariant. And our theorem at that point was um, that there exists um, exactly one real equivariant instanton bundle of type um, M and the other invariant is equal to zero. So if type M zero for any M, um, there is a exactly one equivariant instanton bundle with a real condition and there don't exist any of this condition. And the reason we we're interested in that is because we had recently been studying in a series of papers with Gil and Lorenzo Sedun, we have been studying non-minimal Yang-Mills connections on S4, which had initially been believed not to exist um, they turned out to exist. Um, Sidner, Sidner, and Ullenbeck found the first examples on the trivial um, bundle over S4. And we had found, uh, Lorenzo and I and Gil Bohr, kind of working various combinations, had found that they in fact exist for all um, values of the Chern class, not equal to plus minus one. And in fact, they're um, equivariant um, of type MM prime, where you count that on the force very similar way. And this is the second churn class how it relates to those. Okay. And so this work looking at the um, non self dual Yang Mills connections and non minimal ones, we we're interested to resolve some technical problems with that, whether there were actually equivariant instantons, minimal Yang Mills connections. And we resolved those in 97 with this equivariant construction. Um, it turns out that this real condition that we had studied in 97 that we included can actually be omitted. Um, and this is this was initially proved by a Fianzi who didn't know about our work. And last year I proved this independently, hadn't published this yet, unaware of Fianzi's work. So um, it turns out that the real condition that Gil and I had included back in 97 doesn't actually affect the classification, that there's no additional um, equivariant instanton bundles that don't have the real condition. So the original classification with the real condition carries over and as a classification even without the real condition. And um, I'm gonna outline a proof that I did of this last year, uh, which is transferable when I'm working on right now to other um, three-dimensional manifold, to other three-dimensional um, complex manifolds, which admit instantons where people understand how to study instantons. And in particular, these notice, these include Mukai, Mukai and Momura V5 and V22 surfaces. And uh, I'll just make some brief comments about those, but not too much. Um, so the key to understanding all these approaches to the equivariant instantons is understanding the possible SL2 reps on these vector spaces W and V that are used in the modan to construct the, the bundles. And for that, uh, we're going to use the Atiyabot fixed point theorem um, for the restriction of the SL2C to a C star subgroup. Um, and the Atiyabot fixed point theorem for holomorphic bundles applies for, in our situation, it'll apply to any SL2 equivariant bundle on P3, not necessarily just instanton bundles. Instanton bundle, you can tensor with various other bundles, which we'll, we'll do. And also we'll recall that um, 
the action of C star subgroup of SL2 has four fixed points. So what the Tiabat fixed point theorem does for you, computes the virtual C star character, which is the character um, of H zero of your vector bundle minus the character of H one plus character of H two minus the character of H three. And what virtual means is that this may not be the character of an actual representation. It might be the character of a representation minus the character of another representation. And we'll call character actual, we'll call virtual character actual if it's actually the character of a real um, representation. Okay, So turns out that a virtual C star character that's invariant under this transformation is actually a virtual SL2 character. You can look, figure that out by looking at weights of the um, of the irreducible SL2 representation. That's a pretty easy exercise. And a virtual SL2 character may or may not be an actual SL2 character. Here are some examples. If you get this character for a uh, C star character, um, this is actually the character of a real, of an actual C star representation. If you break it up this way, it's the uh, character of the two dimensional representation plus the, or sorry, the three dimensional representation plus the one dimensional representation. Whereas if you get this similar looking character, um, it is actually a strictly virtual character. It is not the character of an actual representation. This is the, this is the virtual character of C, where C plus this representation is equal to this representation. You can't, um, if you try to, you can't cancel this one. So it's not an actual representation. So this is a actual. Represent this is a character of an actual SL2 representation. This is a character of just a virtual one, a strictly virtual one. So, and a, an obstruction to having these equivariant instantons for invariants M and M prime is if any of these characters for the vector spaces V or W are virtual representations that are not actually actual representations of SL2. So, here's what Atiyah Bach gives you for the V vector space in the um, monad construction gives you this character, which depends on M and M prime. You compute this with a Tiabat um, fixed point formula. For this bundle, this is the bundle you plug into there, and you use the fact that V is the first cohomology of that, and all the other ones cancel. So up to a sign, the Tiabat fixed point theorem, you easily fix that sign, gives you the character on V, because all the other terms and alternating sum vanish. So up to assign this and V have the same character, okay? Um, and similarly for W, um, again, it could be a virtual character. For the C star action is given by similar formula, which again, depends on M and M prime. And that comes from applying the Atiyabad formula to this bundle um, and using the fact that W is this cohomology of that bundle and all the other cohomology vanishes. So on the alternating sum of characters, you really get the character of this one up to a sign. So the first question is whether for a given pair of, of um, integers M and M prime, both these are actual characters. So we'll call integer pair um, admissible if both these representations that you get from a Tia bot are actual representations of SL2C, not just virtual representations of SL2C. And the result for this is if you work out a lot of representation theory, whenever M prime is equal to zero, um, um, the if M zero, when M prime is equal to zero is admissible for any M greater than or equal to zero. This was essentially what was already known by in the paper by uh, Gill and me in 97, what Fianzi also figured out in a different way um, later. And what I worked out last year without knowing about Fianzi was the non-zero M prime case. So Gill and I didn't need that because we used other methods to um, rule out basically the reality condition that we use other methods that, so we didn't have to look at the non-zero M prime, but I worked it out without the reality condition recently and found that some of them are admissible and some of them are not. Um, one M needs to be bigger than M prime and they have to be the same parity for them to be admissible. So it rules out some of them, but not all of them. And you can in fact write down the um, representations as some sums of irreducible representations, okay? And so here's some examples of the W and V for a couple of values of M and M prime that you work out from this formula. Um, all right, so um, the ADHM um, worked out back in 78. Um, what the conditions for these maps that we figured out what the representations on these vector spaces are that we need to worry about in this monad. And then we go back to 1978 ADHM and they tell us 
um, what conditions maps between them have to satisfy. So since we're looking at, um, at SL2C equivariant instantons, all these maps have to be SL2C equivariant maps between representations of SL2. And we already figured out the various possible representations of SL2. They have to satisfy these conditions. So it's essentially linear algebra or quadratic algebra because you can have quadratic conditions on linear maps. Um, and there's, a, there's another condition, which was in the original ADHM, which is this reality condition, which is the, what you need in order for these things to correspond to actual Yang Mills instantons on the four dimensional sphere. And if you omit this condition, you're talking about the mathematical instanton bundles, which is what we're interested in here. So Gil and I looked at this with the ADHM reality condition. Um, Fianzi didn't look at it with this. And last year when I looked at it independently, I also didn't look at that. So this one we're omitting. Um, the linear algebra turns out to be pretty much the same though. Um, but, but basically some of this was from work of uh, Gil and me in 70, 97, some of it was from Fianzi's work on 07, which I independently figured out this other way recently. Um, and the results are for any admissible M and M prime, that means both of the representations are actual representations of SL2. If M prime is equal to zero, there exists exactly one solution. You work that out by doing the linear algebra, actually classifying the maps that respect the equivariance and satisfy these conditions. And that's a lot of linear algebra. It's not particularly deep, but it's pretty involved. Um, and what I worked out um, recently um, that for M prime is greater than one, even if they're admissible, there exists no solution. So basically Gil and I got around having to worry about the case with M prime equals one by using some stuff about reality. Fianzi got around it by cleverly figuring out the representations for the possible cases and narrow them down further. But this method that I did requires a little bit more work, but it gives you the condition on M prime greater than one. And also it turns out there's no solutions for those. And the reason I'm interested in, in this, and the reason I'm doing it this way is because for the other SL2C equivariant threefolds that um, admit instantons, and that includes the Mukaya Mamara V5 and V22, this method carries over, whereas I don't know how to carry over the other methods. Um, so let's um, do some final remarks on the equivariant instantons here. So as I just mentioned, um, my interest in sort of doing this in detail now is to also carry this over on V5 and V22. Um, and so for these cases, um, this combination of authors did various contributions and studying instantons on these, and this is a very interesting topic. Um, and there's other manifolds in here, other three manifolds where you can study instantons, um, but these are the ones that have a nice instanton structure and also have an SL2 action with open orbit. So these are the ones that I'm interested in because um, as we'll talk about in the second part, I have specific conjectures about what happens if you have an SL2 equivariant instanton on a threefold. Um, and let's see, so um, the, similarly for both of these, you have these M, this should be an M prime, and you have these M, M prime invariants, which are defined very similar way. And also you have pan levee six by deforming rational curves in all these cases for P3, which is a subject of this talk and for these Mukai and Mamura. So basically there's a lot of similarities between these that they all have an SL2 action with a dense open orbit. You can classify um, or you can get invariants for the equivariant bundles by looking at these weights. Um, you can construct instantons on all these. The P3 case is well known. Um, for the other ones that's more recent and more involved work. And from all of them, you can get solutions of pan levee six by deforming certain types of rational curves, which Hitchin did in these various cases, P3, um, V5, and V22 respectively in the, in over a series of years. Okay. Um, so one of the things I've been looking at recently, I'll just say some preliminary comments on this is the V5. Um, and in this case, the second churn class you can figure out is even for any equivariant instantons, you apply the um, Atiyah-Bot fixed point formula in a similar way. And um, this also implies, since this has to be non-negative, it implies that there's no equivariant instances. So there's some easy consequences of the, um, of the Atiyah-Bot theorem, sorry, of the Atiyah-Bot theorem together with the fact that these authors tell you what the representations are as far as homology, particularly Fianzi tells you that. And so I have a conjecture that 
it works the same way as on P3, namely that there is a unique equivariant instantons for any time that m prime is equal to zero. So for each value of m and m prime is equal to zero, you have a unique equivariant instanton, which is exactly what happens on P3, as we already know. And some of these cases, this case holds trivially. Um, Sana in 14 um, proved this case. And I recently checked by a more involved calculation, the two zero case holds. There's a unique equivariant instanton in these cases. And also conjecture, just like on P3, that there's no equivariant instantons in for m prime is equal to one. Um, and so it's easy to check that. Um, so you already know this is the case. Um, but from the Atiyah bot, you can check that none exists here except for the trivial zero equals zero zero case. And um, I also recently checked again with a more involved calculation that there's no equivariant instanton of this type. So basically, um, I believe that for V5, things are going to work out the same way as for P3, namely, there's a um, countable family of equivariant instantons. And there's, um, for each turn number, there's either zero or one. So there's a very specific sequence of turn numbers where they occur. And for those turn numbers, there's exactly one. And what I'm going to talk about in the second part of this talk is a reason why this sort of should happen. It's not a proof that it happens, but why um, I think that this is an argument explaining why this happens. And there's probably better arguments for explaining why it's happened, but here's how I understand it. So let's close here and then I'll see you in the second part of the talk where we'll talk about Pan-Levay equations and solutions generated by these equivariant instantons and how they're related um, and also tell you about equivariant bundles. <laughs>